Turn in um, your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1, using the Bibles on the seats, that's page 1182. Colossians 1, beginning to read at verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, Grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people, the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Glorious Lord, we thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you, Lord, that you speak to us through it, that you encourage us, you instruct our minds and captivate our hearts and inspire our lives. And we pray now as we look at this letter to the Colossians in these opening verses that you will indeed speak to us through the power of your spirit. Amen. Please do and be seated and do turn to Colossians chapter 1, those first eight verses we'll look at together. You should have been given a handout if you find those useful. Let me ask you if you recognize um, this man. Anybody know who he is? Um, it's not kind of an old fat fawns from, that's who I thought it was at the beginning. His name is Frank um, Abignale. Recognize that name? You may recognize the name because his life was popularized by the film Catch Me If You Can. Before his 19th birthday, he had successfully performed comms worth millions of dollars by uh, posing as a, a doctor, an airline pilot, uh, and a, a lawyer. His primary um, crime was check fraud, and he became so experienced that you'll remember in the film, it's based on a true life story, he's an actual guy. Uh, that the FBI actually went to him for help uh, in catching um, out um, other Czech forgers. And the reason that he was so good at fraud, which he clearly was, and then brilliant at catching fraudsters afterwards with the FBI, is because he knew the genuine articles down to the smallest um, detail. You see, it wasn't so much that uh, he knew just what error was, but he knew the checks and uh, every little detail, every bit of paper, every bit of dot of ink, so that he could spot a fake um, from a mile um, away. And that's the case with the Apostle um, Paul. The truth of the gospel, the reality of conversion and of Christian living is so forged in his mind that he can spot um, false teaching or fraudulent Christian claims from a mile away because he is so acquainted and familiar with the truth, with the reality. He knows the genuine article down to the smallest details. And that is precisely what he sees in these Colossian Christians. He sees people who are the genuine article. He sees those who have received the true message of the gospel, verse 5 and are bearing all the hallmarks of a genuine believer. So as we begin with these opening verses, we see in an authoritative um, letter, um, Frank Abagnale was only employed by the FBI because of his expertise in the area. Do you think they would have brought him out of prison to work with them if he wasn't so qualified? No, he showed expertise in the area, and Paul can only speak with authority in this area of the gospel, of Christian conversion, of Christian living, 
because of the role that he's been given by God. He is an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, when he calls him an apostle, Paul is not claiming about a status that he's been given. It's not saying, look, I'm an apostle. This is a status I have. He claims about a task that he's been given. To be an apostle is to have a certain role, a certain task. God-given gifts and expertise. And the task was one of proclaiming the gospel, making Christ known, seeing his church built. And so when Paul speaks to the Colossian Christians, when this letter arrived in Colossae, and as we listen to it over um, the next um, few months, he's not writing to us or addressing them or us as some private individual. No, he's writing to them with the authority of Christ, with God-given expertise. And therefore, that should affect that one phrase, that phrase of, of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, should affect how we listen and how we read Colossians. You see, we read it with confidence because these words are powerful because they're of an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. We read and we listen carefully because we, these words are precious because they're of an apostle of Jesus, of Christ Jesus, by the will of God. And we listen and respond in commitment because these words have a purpose for God's people because they're of an apostle of Christ Jesus, of the will of God. Do you, do you see that? Just that opening phrase completely shapes and transforms how we read Colossians and how we listen to the sermons over the next 14 weeks. Is that your resolve for 2017? That's what I've been thinking about this, this week as I read the opening phrase. Is it our resolve that we will listen to God's Word, recognizing, having confidence in its power, listening carefully because we know that it's precious, being committed to living it out because we know it has a purpose for us? Because these words come from Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. They have God's authority all over them. So this letter has authority. Paul is no fraud, but he writes to a group of people who are in Christ. So these people are not fraudsters either. They're the real deal. Paul's main concern when he writes to them is not their geographical location, not the fact that they live in this city, Colossae, but the fact that they are in Christ. Their holiness, their faithfulness, the fact that they are adopted as sons all come from the fact, verse 2, that they are in Christ. Now, what does it mean? It's such a small phrase, isn't it? In Christ. We read it so often in Colossians, throughout the New Testament. But what does it actually mean? Well, in this phrase, these Two words, there's such a richness of truth and biblical teaching. But let me just pick up on a few things that you get from Colossians. In Christ, it's an intimate thing, expressing a closeness of, of union. In Christ, it's about union. His death is our death. His resurrection is our resurrection. His victory is our victory because we are in Christ. It's an intimate thing. But it's also an exclusive thing. Thing. It speaks about being joined to him. We're in Christ. It's about a union, um, an intimacy. We're in him, and therefore you can't be in Artemis, or you can't be in materialism, or you can't be in Buddhism and in Christ. Because if you are in Christ, it's an exclusive thing. So it's an intimate thing, and it's an exclusive thing. It's a change thing as well. If you're in Christ, then this means that we become more like Christ. The one who we are in starts to get formed in us so that we start to bear his likeness. So it's an intimate thing, it's an exclusive thing, it's a change thing, it's a secure thing, affirming our assurance. Because if we're in Christ, no power can pluck us out of Christ. 
So it's a secure thing, but it's also a corporate thing. Because if we're in Christ, then we've been brought into a family with all those others who are in Christ. And so when you hear the phrase in Christ, it's a corporate thing because we are united with those who are in Christ. So such a small phrase, in Christ, and yet so many wonderful truths. They were the genuine article, the real deal. But being in Christ always works out in an authentic Christian life, verses 3 to 5. As I said, Paul knew the signs to look for. He knew what the genuine article um, looked like. When the new five-pound note came out, we were fascinated by them. My um, son, um, Benjamin, um, just asked if I got any. He wanted to get his old five pounds and trade them for the um, new ones. Um, you look at it, don't you? You want to familiarize yourself with the genuine article. You want to make sure that it's got that clear um, window with a queen's portrait that you can see through. You want to make sure it's got the gold Elizabeth Tower on the front and the silver Elizabeth Tower um, on the back. You want to make sure that it's got the 3D crown that is multicolored when you tilt it. You want to familiarize yourself with the genuine article. You want to make sure that it's the real thing, don't you? And Paul speaks of the Colossians. He speaks of the Colossian Christians and he says, look, you've got faith, hope, and love, which is a way of saying, look, you've got the three hallmarks of what it means to be a genuine believer. So let's explore these together, and let's begin with looking at faith. Biblical faith is not some kind of um, abstract thing. Biblical faith always has an object, okay? And it's, it, well, it's a person, it's faith in Christ Jesus. But biblical faith is not something that's hidden. It's something that is noticeable. So faith in Christ, and it's a noticeable faith, not just an internal thing that no one can see, but faith connects us to Christ. That's what we need to think about when we think of biblical faith. Now, in order to unpack this, I want to retell you a story that took place between a Bible translator and a Massey um, elder, okay? And this story actually took place. They were debating about the word um, to translate in his, his language for um, faith. Now, the translators had chosen this word, obviously with help, um, and it was about a, a hunter, maybe a, a white hunter, who shoots an animal from a, a distance with a rifle. But it's about the word was to get across the idea of connecting uh, with something. But the elder found this word unsatisfactory. And he said to the translators, it's unsatisfactory because only the eyes and the trigger are involved in the action. And so he said, no, to believe is like a lion going after its prey. His nose and eyes and ears pick up the prey. His legs give him the speed to catch the prey. All the power is involved in the death leap and the blow to the neck with a front paw that finally kills the animal. And as the animal goes down, the lion envelops it, pulls it to himself and makes it part of him. That is the way a lion kills its prey. And the elder said, and that is a way that a man believes. That is faith. You see, faith takes up the whole person. It's not some secret inner thing. It takes up the whole life, the whole being in trust and belief in Jesus Christ. So much so that Paul could say of the Colossian Christians that we give thanks since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. He's heard about their faith because their faith is evident. It was a kind of faith that others were talking about and that could be seen. And one thing you can rest assured on throughout the whole of the Bible is that biblical faith is noticeable rather than questionable. When people say to me, you can't question my faith, faith can only be questioned if people make it questionable because it's not evident. It's not on show. It's not seen and heard about. 
which is the essence of biblical faith, this faith that God grants is a faith on display, not hidden away. So do question yourself. It's one of the questions on the notes that you can take away with you. Do you have a noticeable faith or a questionable faith? When you look at the new five pound, you, there's a clear window that you want to see, to see that it's a genuine article. And when you see a Christian, you want to see their faith in Christ clearly seen in action, that it's transparent that they believe in Him and are governed by Him. The second hallmark there in verse 4 is love. A real faith will certainly be seen in love, love which you have for all the saints. Now, did you spot the striking word in that phrase. Sometimes the smallest words can be the most striking. He says, they have a love for all the saints. Now, what a challenging statement. Their delight was found in sacrificial care for their fellow believers, all of them. They cared for each other's needs, all the people. Isn't that amazing? All. Now, you might be thinking, well, how, how on earth can we do that? Not just practically about whether you can love everyone to that extent physically, but even well, how do I get there with my mind? And look at verse 8. You see, humanly speaking, we don't. And it was told us of your love in the Spirit. This is not a, a natural thing that we can bring about as sinful human beings. This is something that is brought about by the Spirit of God. You see, because of my sinful nature, my temptation is to love those who love me. That's a narrow love. That's not the biblical love. Or another temptation is that I stop loving people at the drop of a hat. An easy come and easy kind of girl love. But that is not biblical love. That is not the Spirit brought about love. Or we choose when to love People, a circumstance determined love. If the circumstances are right, then I can love this particular individual. But that is not a spirit inspired love. Or we choose to love based on certain criteria, a criteria based love. But that is not a spirit inspired love. See, Paul commends them because they have love for all God's people. Now let that rest upon you, each one of us this year. How are we expressing our love for all God's people? Those that are not like us, don't naturally go in our circles. Because that is a spirit-inspired love that pushes out to all God's people. When you look at the new five-pound um, note, you see the crown uh, with all its colors all the colors of the rainbow. And when you look at a Christian, you will see all the wonderful colors of God's inspired love, pushing them out in love for all their fellow believers. You see, a Christian is not just someone who is tied to Christ with the unbreakable bond of his love, but we're woven together in a garment of love that the Spirit is bringing together United in Christ, loving one another. But the third um, leg of the stool of Christian authenticity is there in verse 5, hope. Paul states that hope is the reason for their faith and love because of the hope stored up for you in heaven. So he sees this hope as the root of the Colossians' um, behavior. Now, this idea of hope, it's, it's worth saying, but many of you have heard it before. We use hope in a kind of wishful thinking kind of way. Oh, I hope it doesn't rain tomorrow, or I hope I catch my um, train, or I, um, I hope um, Hull win this um, game. It's a wishful thinking. But biblical hope is not like that. It's an anticipation, an expectation, a fulfillment of something that has been promised and is certain because it relies on what God has said. 
Hope has an aim based on the promises of God and the work of Jesus Christ. Hope moves our vision away from everything that is temporal and immediate into the reality of the eternal world that lies ahead and that we're being fitted for by Jesus Christ. And he says, look, it's this hope, this hope of the things to come, certain through the work of Christ, based on the promises of God. And that hope makes it possible to love all the saints. Now, work that out. Because when we focus on the immediate, when we focus on the temporary, when we focus on this world, we immediately focus on self or in a circle around us, and we cannot branch out even to those who are not like us within the congregation. No, hope is a mark of the believer. When you look at the new five-pound note, you want to see the golden Elizabeth tower on the front. And when you look at a Christian, you want to see towering over their whole life the hope of heaven. And it casts a shadow over every single thing that they do. The hope of heaven, a huge tower that casts a shadow over everything we do. So we live in that shadow all of our lives. These Colossians Christians had the hallmarks of a genuine church of Christ. Faith, love, and hope. But these things are only possible when the genuine gospel is proclaimed, which brings us to our final verses, an accurate and attested gospel, verse, second half of verse 5 to the end. Now, this connection is hugely important for us, for our situation now and our current um, climate. Many would have us believe that you can bring about the same results by proclaiming a different gospel. So you can proclaim a different gospel, but you can still bring, have faith, love, and hope. You can still get those things. But it's not so. You see, the Colossian Christians are a product of receiving the genuine gospel. That's why Paul is at pains at this point to point out about this gospel. The reason there are genuine Christians in Colossae who Paul can give thanks for is because the genuine gospel went to Colossae with Epaphras. Now this is hugely important because the idea that you can bring about biblical faith, biblical love, biblical hope without the biblical gospel is completely missing it, isn't it? It doesn't exist. The link is this is proclaimed and this is produced. And if this is not proclaimed, this cannot be produced. You cannot have one without the other. Why is St. John's growing as it is? Why is it growing in number? Why is it growing in maturity? <clears throat> Why are there people strengthening in biblical faith year on year? Why are there people deepening in biblical love for all God's people year on year? Why are there people living under the shadow of the hope of heaven, making decisions that are impacted by the world to come year on year? Because the true Word of God is taught, believed, and lived. It's a product of the Spirit-inspired Word Spirit-inspired living. You see, a genuine mark of the gospel is the fact that it bears fruit and grows. Look at verse 6. All over the world, the genuine gospel changes people. And that genuine gospel did that very same work in Colossae. Faith, love, and hope are not brought about by an insufficient, inadequate, watered-down gospel. No, they heard the true, genuine, powerful, effective, full gospel that is changing lives, Paul says, all over the world. But imagine that one of the Christians in Colossae happens to leave the letter from Paul on the coffee table and their friend comes round in the first century and reads it. 
they'd have laughed this verse up. The whole idea that the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world. Most of the time would not have described the advance of the gospel in the Greco-Roman world in triumphant success. The church was not taking the world by storm in the first century. The Jewish historian Josephus hardly gave mention to Christians. The Roman historian um, Tacitus, I think it is, mentions Christians as Nero's scapegoat for the fires in Rome, but not too much um, else. So the whole idea that the gospel is um, taking, um, you know, bearing fruit and growing all over the world, what was Paul talking about? What could he see that they could not? Well, what he could see was a seed, as small as a mustard seed, that had been sown and would yield a magnificent crop because God would give it the growth. The gospel was bursting forth in small groups of Christians in vital cities throughout the empire. Rome, Corinth, Ephesus, Philippi. You see, that all these places, the gospel was spreading like Japanese knotweed. Anybody involved in the work party knows what that means. It gets everywhere in everything. The difference being that the gospel is not some infestation, but life-giving, a transforming seed. Here's an interesting thing. You can, you can read on this. I read a wonderful article on it. Most world religions have kept their center where they started or where they first took proper root. Islam is still in the Middle East predominantly. It doesn't mean you don't find Muslims throughout the world, but predominantly that's the epicenter. Buddhism, Hinduism, Far East. That's still where they have their epicenter, yeah? But what about Christianity? It's never been bound by culture. It's had its center in Jerusalem. It's had its center in Rome. It's had its center in Europe. It's got into its center now probably, well, no, had its center in North America. Now has its center in South America and some African nations. And probably over the next 50 years will move its center to China. Paul saw something that they could not see. The advance of the gospel cannot be stopped by anything and spreads dramatically. Let me close. The Colossians are held up as the genuine article. Having those three hallmarks of Faith, love, and hope. And I wonder if you held your life up to the Colossians. How would it look? Would it look like this one that Alan tried to pay me with the other week? Would it be more, more like this? Now, I run it off on the photocopier this morning. <laughs> you said, I don't think I'd give in, get away with giving that to Samuel, <laughs> although I'm going to try. Do we look like fakes? And how are we doing as a church? Are we marked by faith in Christ Jesus, firmly in his person, his work? Are we marked by a love for all God's people? A deep love for everyone that forgives and serves? Are we marked by the hope of heaven? A certainty of things to come that changes our outlook and actions today. Well, by God's grace, we are. We are. There's so much to give thanks for. I think it's wonderful when you can read a passage of the Bible that is so positive about a group of Christians and say, that could have been written about us. Faith in Christ Jesus is evident both in word and deed in this congregation. Love for all the saints is growing and deepening each week in response to God's word. People are making decisions in the present, molded by the hope of things to come. We, as a congregation, are bearing the hallmarks of a genuine church. So praise the Lord for his grace and mercy, and that he is working continually within us. Faith 
love, and hope. Amen.